George Bush doesn't care about black people. Did you have any problems with looters? Nothing. You shot them. How many people you shoot? 38. What did you do with the body? Did you take them to? Gave them to the Coast Guard. What the bourgeoisie produces, above all, are its own. Life diggers. Hello again, our dear friends. We're back. This is Aaron. And it's Amr. And welcome to another episode of Das Criminal Podcast. Yay. So there's fireworks in the background. There's confetti. It's great. There might be, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Just a reminder, this is a bonus episode that we normally reserve for our Patreon subscribers, but we are publishing our content for everyone this month because we think these stories are especially important right now. We are sending solidarity to Black and Indigenous people. From the next couple weeks onward, uh, this stuff will go back to Patreon. Also, a content warning, there will be discussions of racism, ableism, violence, and mentions of sexual assault and crimes against children. There is no graphic detail, but we just want to make you aware. So let's jump right into it. On the 29th of August, 2005, the tropical cyclone known as Hurricane Katrina made landfall over southern Louisiana and Mississippi, most famously devastating the city of New Orleans. The damage was catastrophic. Over 1,800 people died, almost all of them poor and black, prompting Kanye West to utter his famous line, George Bush doesn't care about black people. Some of the more famous stories to come out of Hurricane Katrina and its aftermath were those of chaos and crime. These were also heavily racialized, with reporters shamefully captioning photographs of white people gathering food and supplies as finders, while referring to black people doing the same as looters. There were reports of theft, arson, assault, and murder. According to the Financial Times of London, quote, girls and boys sheltering at the convention center were raped in the dark and had their throats cut and bodies were stuffed in the kitchens while looters and madmen exchanged fire, end quote. New Orleans Mayor Ray Nagin remarked that the city had degenerated into a, quote, almost animalistic state, end quote, and that, quote, hooligans were killing people, raping people, end quote. Maureen Dowd of the New York Times described New Orleans as, quote, a snake pit of anarchy, death, looting, raping, marauding thugs, suffering innocents, a shattered infrastructure, a gutted police force, insufficient troop levels, and criminally negligent government planning, this time happening in America, end quote. Setting aside for a moment the implication that pandemonium should normally be relegated to the shithole countries, I want to take a moment to reflect on the larger message we're meant to believe. Without police to enforce order, communities, and specifically Black urban communities, will descend into a chaotic rampage of murder and rape. There's a huge problem with these anecdotes, however, aside from the glaring racism and classism. The stories aren't true. There were no murders at the Superdome and only one homicide at the convention center, and that man, Danny Brumfield, was shot by police. It's actually fascinating how easy this narrative of a descent into disorder is believed by people. Kind of reminds me of the thesis for Lord of the Flies, where the author, William Golding, basically portrays a group of boys uh, from a British private school uh, who end up getting marooned in an island and all the adults are killed. And those boys end up descending into this sort of animalistic savagery because of the absence of authority figures. And you also see it in uh, Christopher Nolan's Dark Knight Rises movie, where Bane takes control of Gotham and uh, removes the police from the equation and suddenly you have like marauding mobs like rampaging into houses pulling people from underneath beds and like beating them up and so on and so forth so basically the, the implication is that a collapse in authority is immediately followed by like just rampant violence and uncontrollable base urges 
maybe I'm naive, but looking at both myself and all my friends, including you, Erin, I'm fairly confident that in the event of a natural disaster, our immediate thoughts wouldn't be to run amok, murdering and slaughtering anything that moves. Yeah, I would agree with that. Thanks for not putting me in the person dying to be a murderer, but waiting for the right circumstances category. (laughs) You're welcome. I'm happy to help. So as we've said, those murders at the Superdome and the convention center just weren't true. And the panic over gun-toting looters was also highly exaggerated. According to Charles Maldonado and Marta Dusen of The Lens in New Orleans, many of the alleged looting cases were actually, quote, desperate people gathering food, water, and supplies, end quote, trying to survive a disaster that claimed the lives of almost 2,000 people. But the manufactured frenzy over these pillaging gangs led directly to law enforcement grabbing even more power to use violence as a means to tyrannize civilians. According to ProPublica, quote, In the chaotic days after Hurricane Katrina, an order circulated among New Orleans police authorizing officers to shoot looters, end quote. If you have two brain cells to rub together, you already know how this goes. It wasn't civilians, but cops who wrought murderous havoc on the city of New Orleans in the days following Hurricane Katrina. In this episode, we're bringing you yet another case of police violence, the Danziger Bridge shooting. We must begin our story against the backdrop of Hurricane Katrina. Though, as we've mentioned, many of the rumors about wanted violence in the aftermath of the storm were fabricated, the hurricane was still a disaster for New Orleans and the Gulf Coast. Flooding, debris, and lack of access to basic needs killed over 1,800 people. Looking at this destruction after the fact, it's easy to wonder, why didn't people evacuate? And some people did, but it's not really that simple. When Katrina hit the coast of Florida on August 25, 2005, it was only a Category 1 tropical cyclone, the worst category being Category 5. Meteorologists expected the storm to weaken and then dissipate. Also keep in mind that prior to Katrina, there were several false alarms where the states surrounding the Gulf Coast issued evacuation orders for incoming hurricanes, only for the hurricanes to dissipate before or shortly after landfall. So I don't condone the notion that false alarms in the past justify skepticism in the present. But I also empathize with New Orleanians when evacuation means spending a lot of money to stay in a hotel without any clear aid or direction from the government. Right. And the opposite of the weather forecast is what happened, and it happened quickly. Katrina turned back toward the coast of Louisiana and Mississippi and grew in intensity. New Orleanians were ordered to evacuate in a very short space of time, fewer than 24 hours before the storm struck land. In my research for this episode, I came across this disgustingly classist discourse blaming the victims of Hurricane Katrina for not evacuating the city. For one, hindsight is 2020, and it's very easy for us now to pontificate that the Pompeians should have evacuated when Mount Vesuvius first started smoking. But as it was happening, lots of people didn't realize how bad it would be. And practically speaking, picking up and leaving isn't as feasible for poor and working class people as it is for people with savings. When catastrophe strikes, whether it be storms, famine, coronavirus, or war, the wealthy people always flee first. Exactly. Of those who stayed in New Orleans during Katrina, most of them were poor and had no savings or usable credit. And being poor meant many depended on welfare assistance, which arrives at the beginning of each month. Now, Katrina struck on August 29th, meaning that those that live paycheck to paycheck were at their most financially insecure. A significant number of those who couldn't evacuate didn't own cars. Many were physically disabled or caring for someone who was, uh, making evacuation more difficult, and almost all were black. And of course, there is the failure of the levees and flood walls. The structures were meant to protect New Orleans and the surrounding areas from flooding in the exact case of a storm like Katrina, but the Army Corps of Engineers bungled the design and construction, and Congress, under both the Bill Clinton and Bush administration, cut funding to levy maintenance. As a result, 80% of New Orleans and all of the Bernard Parish flooded with water laden with chemicals, sewage, and debris, not to mention alligators and venomous snakes. 
the people of New Orleans thought that the levees would protect them and their city, and had no reason to believe otherwise until they were surrounded by death and destruction. In the days following the storm, many people from New Orleans tried to evacuate to the nearby, mostly white suburb of Gretna, Louisiana. But Gretna police literally sealed off the bridge and fired warning shots over the heads of people who tried to cross. People were literally fleeing for their safety and law enforcement pushed them back and pointed guns at them. Fucking psychopathic. So, because this apparently needs to be said, Das Criminal podcast is very anti-Hurricane Katrina victim blaming. And anyone directing their ire at poor, desperate people who stayed in the city rather than at the government which promised protection and then failed to deliver should be ashamed of themselves. But fucking liberals love to frame everything as personal responsibility and choice. Nobody chooses to drown in a hurricane, you dumb fucks. We are also against Hurricane Katrina in general, and we're against all hurricanes at Dusk Criminal. Um, in yeah. fact, we are against uh, hurricanes, tornadoes, flooding, ice Tsunamis. Storms. Tsunamis, definitely. I do think the jury is still out on volcanoes, though. I'm not committing to being against or for volcanoes just yet. Yeah, there are definitely some ambiguous feelings about volcanoes. Yeah, exactly. Did Pompeii have it coming? Yeah, we don't know. I mean, Rome was an imperialist nation, so I'm shrugging. So I'm, I'm just shrugging here. Now, of those who did stay in New Orleans, many sheltered at the Superdome, the covered American football stadium where the Saints play. By the way, American football, not European football. And the city's convention center. As we discussed at the top of the episode, there were horror stories from each of these venues about lethal anarchy. Rumors spread that at the Superdome, for instance, a seven-year-old girl was raped and murdered, and the New Orleans police superintendent said that little babies were getting raped. But this was complete hogwash. Only three people died at the Superdome. Two elderly medical patients and one man who is believed to have jumped from the upper-level seats, and no sexual assaults were reported. And while we want to acknowledge that sexual assault does happen and often goes unreported, and we're not denying that it probably happened during this time, I find it very hard to believe that baby rape was going on in an arena literally constructed to have viewpoints from all angles, and nobody did anything. So why would the NOPD superintendent make such allegations? I think it actually digs down to the core of racist and classist policing in the United States, and how law enforcement uses fear tactics to justify itself, even if it has to fabricate danger. The police want everyone to believe that poor and Black people, if not constantly under surveillance and the threat of violence, will turn into a plundering mob. The thin blue line, they'll tell you, is the only thing protecting you and your family from looting and baby rape. This manufactured chaos is part of a phenomenon that David Correa and Tyler Wall call cop speak. It is, quote, a language that limits our ability to understand police as anything other than essential, anything other than the guarantor of civilization and the last line of defense against what police call savagery, end quote. It's part of the same lexicon that prioritizes the lives of wealthy white people over those of poor black people under the cloak of law and order. Okay, now I've explored cop Facebook pages for research purposes, and so you, our dear listener, don't have to, and found many memes and pictures where cops, sort of in those images, the cops are portrayed as sheepdogs guarding us, the sheep, from some sort of evil wolves or bears or other wild predators. And the caption would often be something along the lines of, The sheep may be equally afraid of the sheepdog and the wolves, but the sheepdog knows his duty. Or some, like, completely banal and inane um, and insane thing to that effect. That is one of the worst analogies I've ever heard. Cops are not exactly known for their zoological expertise. Regarding homicide allegations at the Superdome, I also discovered the worst cameo in the history of Forever. So, Amr, do you know who Chris Kyle is? Or was? Isn't he the guy that was portrayed by Bradley Cooper in that movie, American Sniper? Yes, you nailed it. Chris Kyle is from the Shooting and Crying American Sniper movie. And 
He drunkenly told a group of fellow Navy SEALs in 2012 that in the days following Hurricane Katrina, he and another sniper drove to New Orleans, positioned themselves on top of the Superdome, and shot and killed 30 men who they claimed were armed looters. Chris Kyle was a known liar, so there's no way to verify that. But the fact that he would even say it and brag about it, no less, is beyond sickening. And it evidences why solidarity between oppressed peoples here at home and in other countries subject to United States imperialist aggression is so important. But seriously, think about the fact that a decorated Navy SEAL would crow about picking off poor Black people in the wake of a catastrophic hurricane for fun. My jaw dropped when I read that. And we talk about the crimes of U.S. empire and law enforcement all the time on this podcast, but somehow they always manage to outdo themselves in their absolutely unhinged shit. No amount of fictional books or movies can adequately cover how depraved the U.S. imperial machine is. And also, tons of people consider him a hero, and they, they think that the sad part of his story is like the PTSD that he suffered from shooting those Iraqi kids. Like, no, he is a bad person. He claimed to assassinate Hurricane Katrina survivors. What also, the fuck? Also, the movie has it all wrong. Up until his death, he didn't really have PTSD. Like, this whole crying shtick. Like, that was a purely Hollywood invention. In reality, in his book, he speaks about being proud to, like, shoot, insert racial slurs about Arabs here. Yeah, well, he's apparently proud to shoot at poor black people in New Orleans. That's what he said. I don't think he actually was on top of the Superdome shooting at people. I think he's a compulsive liar. But it's the fact that he would say that and that he would brag about it to his Navy SEAL friends. Like, it's a fun war story. It's sickening. Yeah, it's absolutely insane. And with all of this context in mind, we finally get to the pith of this bitter story. Hurricane Katrina has hit New Orleans and the city is in crisis mode. Not only are people dead and the dying in floodwaters, but they're also dealing with misinformation and scare tactics from law enforcement, media, and the Bush administration. New Orleans police are using gossip about looting and chaos to terrorize survivors. And even at the time, this didn't go unnoticed. On an NBC television fundraiser on September 2nd, 2005, days after Katrina hit, Kanye West went off script when he told viewers, quote, I hate the way they portray us in the media. If you see a black family, it says they're looting. If you see a white family, it says they're looking for food. And you know that it's been five days because most of the people were black. We already realize a lot of people that could help are at war right now, fighting another way, and they've given them permission to go down and shoot us, end quote. I know Kanye is a total enigma in some ways, but damn, he was right on the money with that. On September 4th, New Orleans police allegedly receive a call from an unidentified person reporting gunfire at the Danziger Bridge. Now, there is divergent information as to whether there was actually any gunfire, and to my knowledge, the caller and the record of that report, if there was one, have never been found. Other articles say that police got a call of an officer down, but all of these conflicting accounts from the NOPD are suspicious right off the bat. It's also that claiming that there was a call for of gunfire is interesting because the Supreme Court had previously ruled that police officers are authorized to use deadly force in the event that they suspect that they may be in imminent danger, which is a very subjective condition. And I mean, if you ask someone, well, did you think you were in danger? They'll probably just like nod and wink at you. Um, so if the cop said someone was shooting, they can then justify any extreme response by that precedent. I've been thinking about this recently. So I am a woman and I have faced lots of sexual harassment in my life. And I know statistically that not most men, but some men can be very dangerous. That is a fact. And if a man starts to harass me on the street... I do believe that I may be in imminent danger, like everything tells me that. But if I were to pull out a gun and like shoot a cat collar, I would be charged. Oh yeah, it would be it would be like at least second degree murder. Yeah. So how come 
police officers are not held to the same standards as regular people, because I do have good reason to believe if a man is harassing me that he might try to like touch me or escalate the situation further. But I obviously, I wouldn't use violence unless it was like the complete last resort, as in like if someone had their hands on me, because that makes the situation worse, like worse for me. And I know that. Well, I mean, you could do what cops do and carry a spare gun that you can then drop at a corpse's location and say that you were, you know, defending yourself because they were going to fire at you, which is, by the way, a thing that happened. Yeah, we'll get we're, into we're, that. Yeah. According to the Associated Press, it is possible that people in the area of the Danziger Bridge were trapped and fired shots or flares to try and attract the attention of rescue workers. No weapons were ever found at the scene, and the victims were all unarmed. Seven NOPD officers arrived at the bridge. Rather than using a police vehicle with lights and sirens, they came in a budget rental truck, and none of them were in uniform. The plainclothes officers were armed with rifles, including AK-47s and an M4 carbine assault rifle. At least one of these weapons was an unregistered firearm, meaning it did not have a serial number or the serial number wasn't in a database that could trace it back to the owner. Put a pin in this tidbit because, like we said, we're going to come back to it. According to witnesses, the officers jumped out of the unmarked vehicle, lined up, quote, like at a firing range, end quote, and opened fire on a family walking on the bridge. The family, the Bartholomews, and their nephew, Jose Holmes Jr., and his friend, 17-year-old James Brissett, had been walking across the bridge to try and get groceries from a Winn-Dixie. All of them were black. Susan Bartholomew's arm was shot off by police. Leonard was shot in the back, head, and foot. Lesha, their teenage daughter, was shot four times. Jose Holmes Jr. was shot in the hand, leg, and jaw. Leonard Jr., who was 14 years old and weighed 85 pounds, ran and hid, but police still shot at him, fortunately missing despite riddling the rest of his family with bullets. James Brissett, only 17 years old, was killed by the police officer's gunfire. James was a quiet kid. He liked to read, play video games, and draw. His teachers noticed he was a gifted student, especially in literature, and he spent much of his time in the library. As a high school student, he was just beginning to make plans for his future, considering going to college for computer drafting or perhaps to culinary school. Even years after his murder, James's mother, Cheryl, couldn't bring herself to hold a funeral and admit that her baby was gone. Her son had survived Hurricane Katrina only to be shot and killed by police officers days later. How does anyone cope with that? When the other people on Danziger Bridge saw the police shooting at the Bartholomews and murdering James Brissett, they ran for their lives. Think about it. There are all these reports going around of bloodthirsty gangs opening fire on people. Then you're minding your own business and a budget rental truck pulls up, seven men with assault rifles get out, and they fire at a fucking family. I'd be like, oh fuck, these are the murders that everyone has been talking about. And then I would run as fast as I could and try to hide somewhere. I'd honestly probably think I was in the middle of a terrorist attack. And in some ways that would be true. It's just that the terrorists in this case are the police. And two of the people running in this situation were Lance and Ronald Madison, who were also black. The police chased them to the other side of the bridge while firing at them. They shot Ronald Madison seven times, five times in the back, and then one officer stomped on him as he lay dying. Ronald Madison was 40 years old and had impaired intellectual and adaptive functioning. His family said his mind functioned similarly to a seven-year-old and he had a childlike spirit. Ronald loved to watch Three Stooges videos, and he adored the Madison family's two dachshunds, who he played with all the time. Due to lack of police accountability and federal funding, plus varied criteria for what constitutes a disability, statistics are difficult to obtain. But news organizations and nonprofits estimate that between 25 and 50% of people killed by law enforcement in the United States are disabled. Many are deaf, blind, and mobility impaired, or have cognitive, intellectual, and developmental disabilities. And lots of these victims are also Black, 
Indigenous, or people of color. And Lance Madison ended up being arrested by police and charged with eight counts of attempting to kill police officers while his brother died from being shot in the back. Lance was later released after spending three weeks in jail for literally running away from a mass shooting while being black. His own brother was murdered in front of him, and they still tried to pin it on him. So, remember how we mentioned that one of those assault rifles was unregistered? After the shooting, NOPD Lieutenant Michael Lohman encouraged the officers involved to say that they had been fired on first, and to plant a firearm at the scene. This type of hoax isn't unheard of in police shootings. David Correa and Tyler Wall explain, quote, The throwdown weapon, or drop gun, is police slang for an untraceable weapon, usually a gun or knife, that police officers sometimes carry in addition to their service weapon. If an officer is involved with a shooting with an unarmed suspect, the officer will plant the throwdown weapon near the victim in order to mislead investigators into declaring the shooting justified, end quote. I can't find any concrete evidence that they actually did plant a firearm in this case because no weapons were found at the scene. The officers involved in murdering James Brissett and Ronald Madison didn't have to try very hard to hide what they'd done, though, because the lead detective assigned to the case, Arthur Kaufman, conspired with them to fabricate reports and conceal evidence to try and make the shootings appear justified. Oh boy, now we come to the cover-up, which is a hell of a case. The attempted cover-up of the shooting at Danziger Bridge was extensive and involved smearing the victims, as cops often do. For instance, NOPD said that Ronald Madison had been shot once when he had actually been shot seven times. They also said that Lance Madison and Jose Holmes Jr. had been shooting at police, which is totally untrue. At one point, when Arthur Kaufman was making up eyewitness testimony, he shouted to a room full of cops, hey, somebody give me a name, to write on the report, and somebody responded, Lakeisha. Absolute racist lying fuckwads. Luckily, both eyewitness accounts and physical evidence disputed these false claims. Two separate independent autopsies confirmed that Ronald Madison had been shot not once, but seven times. Somehow, I don't believe that the county coroner, a man named Frank Minyard, honestly missed six bullets. There was definitely a cover-up. Minyard has been repeatedly accused by activists of altering his findings to show favor to police. If you haven't yet listened to our episode on forensics and law enforcement deceit, episode 14, we'd really recommend it. Thus, word of a cover-up started to leak. Moreover, the victims and their families would not let it go. Despite being told repeatedly by law enforcement and government officials to stop fighting, they refused to back down. And in January of 2007, almost a year and a half after the shootings, the seven officers were finally indicted on counts of murder and attempted murder but any closure brought by that was short-lived. In August of 2008, the indictments were dismissed due to allegations of prosecutorial misconduct. Sometimes I wonder if the prosecution intentionally sabotages their own case against police to have them achieve a mistrial or dismissal or get them thrown out. Yeah, we don't want to dip too much into conspiracy theories, but I don't think that's hard to imagine, really. Yeah, I mean... If the prosecutors are going golfing with the cops or whatever, or they're drinking or whatever the hell they do, there's a conflict, a fundamental conflict of interest where you're prosecuting the guys you also are buddies with. So I don't know. I'm 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 not again, like like you said, I'm not going into conspiracy theories, but from what we've explored in this podcast so far, I wouldn't put it beyond them. Right. Yeah. Some of the officers were once again charged on the federal crime of deprivation of rights under color of law, which asserts that denying someone the right to life through murder is a federal crime. Four of the officers who had been involved in the Danziger Bridge shooting were found guilty in 2011, as was Arthur Kaufman for the cover-up. But once again, due to prosecutorial misconduct, their sentences were reduced in 2016. Presently, the sentences are as follows. Kenneth Bowen was sentenced to 10 years. Robert Falcon Jr. was sentenced to 12 years. Robert Jasevius Jr. was sentenced to 10 years. Anthony Villavaso was sentenced to 7 years. 
and Arthur Kaufman was sentenced to three years. All of them were also credited with time served and will have five years of supervised release following their departure from prison. In 2016, New Orleans Mayor Mitch Landreau announced that the city had made a settlement agreement to pay an undisclosed amount to the victims of the Danziger Bridge shootings and their families. He also issued a public apology. That is getting off so light for committing an actual terrorist attack. Yeah, imagine if I did what they did and I shot at a bunch of people on a bridge. I'll be fucking staring at the death penalty. Oh no, you wouldn't survive. Yeah. You'd be shot. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, probably, yeah. So, Malcolm Suber, a black Marxist-Leninist professor, Hurricane Katrina survivor, and one of the founders of the People's Hurricane Relief Fund, said of these horrific events, quote, The disclosures around Danziger and other cases of police violence after the storm represent a real opportunity to raise some fundamental questions about the nature of police and what they do. Regarding federal involvement, I don't think we can call on a government that murders people all over the world every day to come and supervise a local police department. End quote. And I think Professor Suber is right. The Danziger Bridge shootings should really force us to take a look at the role of law enforcement in this country. It has been 15 years, and while it's good that more people are having these conversations, we must also acknowledge that it's too late for James Brissett and Ronald Madison. We cannot bring them back, but we can honor their memory by creating a more just system which protects poor, Black, and disabled people from state violence. We must also remember, the homicidal plunderers after Hurricane Katrina weren't the struggling civilians. It was the police who committed the most violence. NOPD, for instance, stole a generator from Tulane Hospital, which would have been essential to keeping medical patients alive during the power outage, and they used it to chill beer. The heartlessness is incalculable. And it was law enforcement who opened fire on people looking for safety and supplies on the Danziger Bridge. They used rumors of chaos as a pretext to inflict more violence upon Black survivors of the storm. And that's also why it's crucial journalists verify claims of murderous anarchy before printing those allegations. The manufactured anxiety over poor and Black people pillaging New Orleans in part instigated the killings at Danziger Bridge and other white vigilante violence around the city. Racist fabrications do not come without consequences. Furthermore, looting is not a valid reason to murder someone. The context of Hurricane Katrina also takes broken windows policing to a stellar level. Broken windows policing refers to the idea that improperly maintained buildings, that is, those with broken windows, are emblematic of social disruption and thereby enable criminal activity. It is, of course, a creative way to say that police should focus their patrols on poor neighborhoods. Broken windows policing is also based on these very false theories that were disproven years ago. These theories emerged in the 70s and 80s, and they basically used studies that showed that a parked car with a broken window was much more likely to be vandalized than one that was not broken. But a deeper dig into those studies showed they were very much filled with flaws and very poorly constructed, which I think pretty much emphasizes that just because someone who like, you know, justifies his racism with some sort of research or scientific studies like Charles Murray's The Bell Curve, it doesn't mean they're valid, it doesn't mean the research was good, it doesn't mean the conclusions were legitimate or accurate. Right, yeah. And also, in the case of Hurricane Katrina, all the windows were broken. It was a fucking hurricane, a literal window-smashing glut of gator-infested water, and the physical damage to the city of New Orleans gave police an excuse to strengthen their control, because the assumption was that without them, the already sunken city would further devolve into a dystopian purge. It's the archetypal image of the desolate urban landscape in need of a good capitalist scrubbing, outlined in Naomi Klein's Shock Doctrine. But the real story is that yes, while some people, mostly law enforcement and corporations, did use Hurricane Katrina as an alibi for violence and economic pillaging, most people came together to help one another. Those with boats used them to rescue people from the water. People who lived in sturdier apartment blocks or higher areas invited friends and strangers to shelter with them. 
artists, musicians, and poets hosted community events for healing. There's still a lot to be done to bring justice to the people of New Orleans who were failed by the system at every turn. Katrina has been used as a pretext for racism, violence, expulsion, and gentrification. But people have been fighting hard, and the fight is not over. Jordan Flaherty, a survivor of the storm, writes, quote, Community will sustain us when the cause seems hopeless. The people of New Orleans have demonstrated that. They stood together and fought back, joined by allies around the world, and reinforced a legacy of resistance. This culture, community, and generosity of spirit continue to inspire all those who love New Orleans. Bringing these elements together will help sustain us in this struggle and cultivate new generations for the next. End quote. That's quite beautiful. I like that. It's a nice way to wrap it up. That was really touching. Yeah, thanks, Jordan, for that quote. So to wrap things up, uh, this is your last free bonus episode for a while. We do think it's important, so please do share widely. For future bonus content, please visit patreon.com slash dascriminal. Instagram is dascriminalpod. Uh, rate us on iTunes and Apple Podcasts. Tell your friends. Talk about this stuff. Uh, we do this podcast uh, so that for an hour or two each week, we can engage in radical education. And do send us any ideas you have or let us know what kind of topics you will want to discuss. And until next time, everyone. Thanks for listening, guys. Bye. Bye.